Welcome back to CS125. I hope you guys enjoyed a break. Oops. Maybe we'll just play music for the rest of the class. It's on repeat. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed a break on Wednesday. And today we're going to introduce a new concept in our discussion of object-oriented programming. And this is actually an idea that's going to help a few things that we've been talking about make a little bit more sense. So this is something that sort of been, has been lurking behind the scenes as we've been talking about objects. Some of you may have sort of noticed aspects of this, and it might have been bothering you. It's just something odd about how object variables, instance variables work. And so today we're going to, to explain that. And this is references, which we're going to introduce today, are a concept that is something that you're going to be thinking about now in this class, and will follow you throughout your time in computer science. Sometimes in other languages we refer to these as pointers. Uh, Java doesn't have pointers, but this idea that I can refer to something, and that reference is not the thing itself. It refers to that thing, uh, but it is distinct from the object itself. All right, and again, I think that this will help clear up and sort of, there's a couple of things that will make more sense once you understand how Java object references work. Okay, so, so let's start by looking over the quiz question. Actually, sorry, this was the homework problem from earlier this week. So, you know, these, these homework problems are new, and from time to time I write one that I really like, and this was one of them. Um, I, I think, I'm not sure everybody here liked it very much. Um, but, you know, this was a problem that was designed to get you thinking about exactly how polymorphism works. And once we talk a little bit about references, toward the end of class, I think some aspects of this problem might make a little bit more sense, right? But, but here, is, here is the challenge. So I gave you a couple of child classes, classes that extended PET, and your job was to implement PET. And PET was supposed to provide one class method, so this is a static method, called speak. And what speak was supposed to do was, depending on what kind of instance it was called on, so speak took an argument that was a PET, but speak needed to, you needed to find a way to distinguish between different kinds of PETs in your speak method. If it was a dog, you're supposed to call a particular method. If it was a cat, you're supposed to call some other method. And, you know, here's the rest of the problem description. You needed to take, provide a constructor. That constructor was called by instances of children of the pet class. There were several of them. We showed you a couple, and there was a couple others that we had behind the scenes to make sure that you were doing things correctly. And there were actually a couple of ways to approach this problem, both of which required you to have some understanding of, of Java polymorphism, right? There was one way to use uh, class polymorphism to do this, and there was another way that you could actually approach the problem using method overriding. All right, so, so here was the setup. I've loaded these classes into our little example runner. Um, so there was a turtle class that we created behind the scenes that didn't have a method you were supposed to call. That was just a test to make sure that you did the right thing if you were called on something that uh, wasn't a dog and wasn't a cat. And both my dog and my cat methods here extend pet, and within their own constructors, they actually did other things as well, but one of the things they did was they called super to run the pet constructor, and they identified to their parent what kind of object they were. And this is something, this is a pattern that you can use to simplify code like this, but you don't have to. Actually, there was another way to do this. Okay, so let's spend a minute and think about how to do this. So one of the things you had to do was you actually had to provide this constructor that the other types are relying on. So I'm gonna create a private string variable here called type, and then I'm going to set at that in my constructor. So now the child class constructors will work. Until you provide this constructor, they won't work because they're calling a constructor on their parent using super that takes a single string argument and parent doesn't, pet doesn't provide that yet. Okay, so now it does. Um, now I need to define a class called speak. So I can't remember exactly what the function signature of this was, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't need to return anything. Um, 
it needs to be static. Sorry, it should be public static, void speak. And it takes an instance of a pet. So this was one way to do this problem. There was actually another way to do this as well. But let's, let's try it this way first. So this takes a pet as an argument. So because of Jolly, remember, Java will automatically upcast references for you. So I can call this on a dog. I can call it on a cat. Because what Java will do is it'll say, well, a dog, you know, the type of the argument to speak is not dog, but because of polymorphism, I can safely convert this dog reference to a pet reference by upcasting it to a pet. Remember, as I go up in the Java hierarchy, I lose features. So I can't, you know, people were, one of the things that we wanted you to struggle with on this question was people were trying to call, you know, uh, woof or meow on the pet reference, but I can't do that because pet doesn't provide those methods. They're provided by its descendants. So if I have a reference to a pet object, I can't assume that it implements woof. I can't assume that it implements meow. I feel dumb about these uh, function names now. Um, if I have a cat reference, I can assume it calls, it implements meow, because all of the descendants of cat will either override that function or inherit it from their parent. So either they have it through descendants, or they can override it if they want to uh, have it behave somewhat differently, but they can't get rid of it. So that, that was the nice thing about polymorphism. All right, so what I need to do here is I need to distinguish between pet references that are actually referring to a dog and pet references that are actually referring to a cat and then other, because there's other kinds of pets. And there were two ways to do this. So uh, one of the ways that we showed you was to use the instance of operator. This is this keyword in Java. And again, I, f I feel embarrassed for not uh, mentioning this when we talked about polymorphism. But there it is, now you know about it. Um, so this will return true if that reference actually refers to something that is of type dog or one of dog's descendants. So if I created a subtype of dog, this would also return true. Essentially what this allows you to determine is whether you can safely downcast that reference to a particular type. So if this is true, then I can downcast my reference from a pet to a dog safely without causing a problem. But I still have to do that downcast. So, so people tried this. This was common. So if it's an instance of a dog, I'm gonna call wolf. What will happen if I try to do this? Right. So what's the problem here? The problem is I still have a reference to a pet, not to a dog. In other languages, you'd be able to get away with this. There are languages where there, you, this would be allowed. But Java's type system says, no, no, no. You have a reference to a pet. There is no guarantee that pet provides this function because it's not declared on the pet class or on any of pet's ancestors. And so before I can use this like a dog reference, I actually have to cast it to a dog reference. So I have to say, pet as dog is equal to dog pet. You might, some people might have also tried this. Also, it doesn't work because Java is gonna say, I can't assign a pet reference to a dog reference. Java won't do this automatically. If the tables were returned, if I was upcasting this, it would be fine, but I'm downcasting and so I actually have to apply, apply an explicit typecast here. Oop. Oh, I need to... Oh, yep, I'm still trying to use my pet reference. There we go. Okay. And I'm sure you can see how to extend this to cats. Questions about this? Yeah. So the instance of... Mm -hmm. Well, so what, I, what am I trying to figure out here? I'm trying to figure out if this is actually a dog, right? right? So saying a dog instance of dog is, is gonna return true, is it an instance of a pet? I could test it for that, yeah. But that wouldn't tell me whether or not I could call this method, right? So the question was, can I use instance of on classes that are parent classes? Yes, you can. Other questions? 
So there's another way to do this problem. I don't know if anybody, a couple people figured this out, I know, because I got some messages about it. So one way is to provide this one method that works for every pet and all of its descendants. But I could exploit Java's method overriding feature here to do this in a way that's a little bit cleaner, actually. So let me show you that. Now get rid of this guy. It's not going to be run. So what happens here? It's kind of cool. Now I'm providing this again. This is another form of polymorphism. So now I'm providing two implementations of speak. One that I can run on a dog reference, and one that I can run on a pet reference. So what happens? on line 38 there, where I call pet.speak, I have a dog reference. So what Java says is it says, is there a method called speak declared on the dog cl pet class? It also has to be static, because I don't have an instance of pet. Is there a static method declared on pet called speak that takes, as its argument, a dog reference? There is. It's, de it's declared on line 27. So that's the one that gets called. When I call pet.speak on line 39 and line 40, on line 39, I have a cat reference. So Java does the same thing. It says, is there a method called speak declared on the pet class, a static method called speak that takes a cat reference as its argument? The answer is no. I can create one. I can do that in just a minute. And so now it says, okay, can I upcast this reference to find a match? So the first thing it thinks is, okay, can I, that its, its ancestor is a pet, so let me try upcasting it to a pet. Is there a method that takes the pet? There is. And so now I can handle every um, object of type pet, because the ones that are dogs will hit the dog uh, implementation. The ones that are cats, turtles, lizards, whatever else you have, will all go through pet. And so the other way to complete this problem was to add just one more of these. This one will take a cat. Yeah, so this would work. Any questions about this? So two ways to approach this. At the end of lecture, we're gonna come back to this example. I know you're probably tired about hearing about my pets. Um, but we're gonna come back to it one more time because we're gonna talk about a limitation of this approach. There's actually something wrong with this. Um, our test suites didn't test it intentionally, um, but we'll talk a little bit about where, where this actually breaks down. Okay. Good. So before we start this conversation, I want to point out that my goal in this class is not to introduce you to Java internals. Um, your goal as, you know, a beginning programmer should be to develop an, an effective mental model for reasoning about how Java does things. And later, you will have to make small changes to this mental model to apply it to Python, and maybe larger changes to apply it to things like Haskell, uh, whatever, Lisp, or you know, whatever. But, you know, the, the, the idea is to get you thinking in terms of these higher-level constructs. We're not really all that concerned with what's going on behind the scenes. You will take courses on that later if you are so interested. We have courses here. Fantastic classes on compilers, so you learn exactly how the compiler converts your Java code to Java bytecode, or a, a version of that. We have courses on computer hardware, so you can learn how the processors actually execute those lower-level instructions, but that's really not our focus here. We will have, I think I'm gonna do kind of a fun lecture on Halloween, where we'll do some spooky Java stuff. So we'll do a little bit of sort of Java-esque internals where we're talking about kind of weird things that you can do with Java. That'll be kind of fun. But today we're gonna talk a little bit about Java internals toward the end, mainly because it's important for you to understand how this works. Um, there's also cases where this will come up because it's either interesting or cool, right? All right, or some combination of, of these attributes. So when we've, been, when we've been talking about the variables that we use to store Java objects, 
What those variables actually contain is something that in computer science we refer to as a reference. Here's the official definition. It's a value that enables a programmer to indirectly access something, such as a variable's value or record in the computer memory or somewhere else. This is a reference. The reference is said to refer to, I don't know why it's using the word datum. Think of this as object, right? So you can safely rewrite all the instances of datum to, in, to object in this. The reference is said to refer to the object, and accessing the object requires dereferencing the reference. So these variables in Java that store quote unquote objects, when I've declared a variable to store a string, or to store a pet, or whatever, they don't actually store the object. What they store is a reference to the object. And we'll see why this is important in a minute. So really, any variable in Java that refers to an object is a reference variable. So I can initialize, I can do this on a class definition, right? So on line six here, my uh, person, well, sorry, um, yeah, normally you can't do this in Java. I have to initialize this. But the variable that I'm declaring here on line six is of type person. Its name is me, but it actually holds a reference to a person object. On line 12, you can see, and this is also something that's going to make null make more sense. So what is null? Null is a special value to indicate that that reference refers to nothing. It's empty, it's blank. I can't convert it into an actual object. So the reference is said to refer to the object. If I have a null reference, it re doesn't refer to anything. It's a special value to indicate that there's no way for me to dereference this. So when you've tried to do that by using dot notation to call one of that reference's methods or to access one of its variables, you've seen these null pointer exceptions. That's where they come from because that reference doesn't refer to an actual object. It's blank, it's empty. All right, so, oh, sorry, I don't think I finished the slide. So when I copy variables, let's just do this on the, the larger example. When I copy object variables in Java, what I'm actually doing is making a copy of the reference. So this is, important to understand, and we'll have a couple of homeworks coming up that will sort of test your understanding of this idea. An easy thing to remember in Java is the following. If you don't see new, then there's no object that has been created. Obviously, strings are an exception to that because I can create one using a string literal. Sometimes if I have a class method that is a factory method that creates new instances of that class, I may not see the constructor being used, but it's still in there still being called by that constructor function. But in a lot of cases, we use new directly in our examples. So on line 14, here's what's happening. The right side of line 14 is creating a new person object. So deep inside the computer's memory, there's a, the, deep inside the computer, there's now a chunk of memory that's being set aside to hold whatever state it is that the person class declares. In this class, it's empty. In this case, it's empty, but if I had instance variables and other information that that class was storing, which is normal, then the memory would be set as enough memory would be set aside to hold all of that information. So on line 14, I see the word new on the right side. So I'm creating a new person object, and I'm setting me, which is a reference to a person, to refer to that new person object. So at this point, before I get to, so on line 12, after line 12 executes, I have created zero person objects. All I have is a reference that's ready to refer to a person object called me. On line 14, I create my first person object because I see the new keyword. Okay, so after line 14 executes, there is one person object that has been created and is sitting in computer memory somewhere. On line 15, what I do is I change you. You is also a person reference. So I change you to refer to the same object that me refers to. 
So this does not create a new object. Do you see the new keyword? That's our rule of thumb. On line 15, no. There are no new keywords on line 15. Therefore, all I have is still one person object. But now what I have are two references, you and me, that both refer to that same person. Don't worry, I have some laboriously created diagrams in a few slides, so we'll, we'll, we'll see this. So the printf on line 16 is actually not comparing those two objects. It's comparing the references. So what this equality test, when you test Java instance object variables for equality using the double equals, what you're actually doing is you're testing whether or not they refer to the same object. So that's going to be true. Now on line 17, for the first time again, I create another person object. So after line 17 executes, I have two persons in my system, two independent places in computer memory that I've set aside to hold data about a person. And the other thing that I'm doing on the left side of 17 is I'm setting you, one of my person references, to refer to this new person. So once that's done, line 18 is going to print false, because now you and me, while they are both references to person objects, they now refer to two different person objects. You refers to the person object that was created on line 17, and me refers to the person object that was created on line 14. Questions about this before we go on? Jeremy. Yes, yes. Sorry, that's a great question. So on line six, which I actually don't think you could write, I think this is, well, I guess you can in our thing. Maybe IntelliJ will stop you from doing this. So what's the default value for a reference? No. So when I, if I declare an int, what's the default value? Zero. If I declare a double, what's the default value? 0, 0.0. No, uh, object references are similar in that their default value is nothing, blank, no. So after I declare that person reference on line six, it initially refers to nothing. So line six is equivalent to line 12. If I don't use a null initializer and I don't provide an initial value, the reference initially refers to nothing. Remember, I don't have a person object until you see a new keyword, and the number of person objects that I have is equal to the number of times that I've called new. Okay. So there is this important distinction between references and the objects that they refer to, and I've been trying to be as accurate as I can when we talk in class to talk about, you know, object references, a reference to an object rather than an object itself. References are not the thing they refer to. References are a way to find that thing. References are a way to access that thing. So can you guys think of some real-world examples of references? This is a case where there's actually some fairly good metaphors out here for an example of a real-world reference. Something that refers to something that is not the thing itself. Yeah, Falcon. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's a great example, right? Web URLs. The URL is not the page. The URL is a way to get to the page. And if I give you 10 different URLs that all point to the same page, and I make a change to that web page, those changes are visible to everybody. So again, there's one web page. There can be lots of different references pointing to it, and sometimes those references could even be different. Yeah. Right. We don't need to get into that, yes. The, the main name itself is actually a reference, right? There's multiple levels of references going on. This is something that computer scientists use all the time, right? This idea of dereferencing is something that's very powerful. Yeah. Key to your house. Okay. Okay, so here's my question, right? Here's how I think about references. If I find the key on the floor, can I find your house? Yeah. 
So a key is a good metaphor for other concepts in computer science, particularly things like security. What is a good reference to your house? Address. Yeah. An address. So if I gave you all my home address, which I don't plan on doing, at least not today, um, you could all go there. And then you could, like, spray paint on my, you know, house and break the windows and stuff like that. Um, I only have one house so far. But if I give you ten different references, I still only have one house. And here's the nice thing about this metaphor. If you go there and, you know, again, you know, put graffiti on my house, then everybody else who goes there is going to see it. So any changes that you make by using that references to my beautiful house will be observed by everybody else who holds the reference. Again, the reference is not my house. You know, at some point, some very smart person built a nice house on Hill Street where we live. There's one house there. That was when the new keyword was used. If I write that address down 50 times, I still only have one house. Now I have 50 references to it. But any changes that you make as a result of that are visible to everybody. So phone number is another good example, right? If I find your phone number, I can call your phone. You know, if you don't want that, don't give me your phone number. Um, street address, same thing. Um, social security number refers to a person. Now, the process of converting these references into an actual, the thing they refer to is different for each one. With the phone number, I just type it into my phone. With an address, I might have to look it up on Google Maps. With the social security number, I might have to, I don't think that you can just go to the social security office and be like, who is this person? All right, I have a number. Um, but somebody can convert that social security number to a person, right? Hopefully, that, but that's not, hopefully there's not a website where it's just like, oh, you know, who is this person? Um, so here's the important thing, and again, this is coming out in these examples that we're using. Copying a reference does not copy the thing it refers to. So if I give you my address and you make ten copies of that and give it to your friend, you're not copying my house. You're copying a reference to my house. If I give you my phone number, same thing. If I hand out my social security number to everybody and you guys make a bunch of copies of it, same thing. You're not making copies of the object that the reference refers to. The, the, the thing, the actual thing in the world, in Java, it's the object that lives in computer memory. You're not making a copy of that. You're just making a copy of the reference so more people can find that object. All right? Questions about this? Before we go on and see it in action a little bit. Okay. So the result of this in Java, and the, the reason this is really important to understand, is that when I have two references that refer to the same object, changes made by either one of them to that object are now visible to both. Okay, so this is where this gets uh, really important and can sometimes be a little bit subtle. So what's going on here? I create this little silly class. On line four, I create a reference to a person called me. So I'm telling Java, I'm going to save a reference to a person in this variable called me. And then on line five, I actually set me to a reference to a new person object. So on line five, I create a person object. So now there is one person object, one person object in my system. On line six, what I do is I create a new reference to a person called you, and I copy the reference from me into you. So what's really important to understand here is that this does not make a copy of the object. It makes a copy of the reference. So how many objects are there in the system at this point? One. I've got two references to it, but there's still only one object. And what that means is that in this case, so essentially, um, I have two references to the same object, and then I use the first reference to make a change to the object. I'm setting the age. So the age was initially zero, because that's the default value for an integer. And then on line seven, I use my me reference to the object to change the age to 10. On line eight, I'm using the you reference to the object to retrieve the age. And what's going to happen is it's going to print 10. So again, I've got two references to the same underlying object, only one object. So any changes that I make using either reference will be visible to anybody who has a reference to that particular person object. All right, here we go. Diagram time. 
So me, in this case, so here's, here's kind of what the state of the world looks like at every point in the execution of this very, very small, simple program. So on line four, I've created a reference, me. So I have a variable, so there is a small chunk of computer memory that's sitting there waiting to, to hold a reference to a person. When I initialize this, it holds nothing, so it's null. If I tried to dereference it, I would get a null pointer exception. Now, once I actually create a new person and set the reference variable to that new person, now I have, as promised, two things. I have me, which is a reference, and you can see why they're called pointers in some languages, because it's a pointer on this, you know, me holds a pointer to the person. And now I've set aside a chunk of computer memory somewhere to hold information about that person. In this case, the only state that that person needs to hold is a single int, storing the age, okay? Now later, once I execute this line, I've created a new reference variable called you, but I've copied the reference from me. So again, I have not copied the object, I've copied the reference. I've now got two references to the same location in memory to the same object. And so either one of those references can be used to do things like modify the age. So here I've modified the age using the me reference, but there's only one person in my system. I haven't copied the underlying person object, and so you can also, I can also use my you reference to retrieve the age. All right. I'm stopping frequently today for questions because this is an important topic, and I want to make sure maybe everybody just understands this, which would be awesome, but I doubt it. Questions about this before we go on and talk about a couple of other things. Okay. Yep, yeah, we just did this. This still works. All right, so let's do a little example just for fun. So, so here what I've done, actually, is I have two person objects. Now I've created a little constructor to set the age. On line seven, the right side of line seven creates a new person object with initial age of 38, and then sets the reference variable me to refer to that person object. The code on line eight creates a new person object with initial age of 18, and sets a reference variable called you to refer to that person object. So here's the state of the world on the right side of the slide once those two lines are executed. So in this case, I actually do have two person objects, and I have two reference variables, okay? So let's say I wanna swap them. This is not that different from swapping other types of variables. So I need a third value, I need a third reference variable to hold one of the references while I do the swap, otherwise I'm gonna lose it. So the first thing I do is I make sure that I have a copy of the same object that me refers to, and I could, you can do this in either order. That allows me to set me to you without losing my reference to me, to, to the original object that me referred to. So when I start off, I have, oop, I'm getting ahead of myself here. When I started off, I had two reference variables, each referred to one object. Now I duplicate one, now I move that, so now I have two references to the other, and now once I move you over to refer to the first object by using my temporary variable, I can discard the temporary variable. So now I have what I wanted. I've swapped the two references. So I started off with two reference variables, two objects, instances of the person object. When I'm done, I've swapped those two reference variables, so they refer to different objects, right? And I can use this to make you age prematurely, actually. There's a bug on the slide, actually. Fix that, okay. Getting older every year. It's amazing how that happens. Um, right, questions about this, again. Yeah. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but th so the question is, can I do this without this temporary variable? So here's the problem. If I take out the temporary variable, then I set me equal to you. So now at this point, I have two references to you. How many references to me do I have? Zero. 
And so there's nothing to copy it from. What happens to the memory when that happens? We will talk about that in a few slides. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so that's why I need this temporary variable. Yeah. I liked where you were going with that question. Maybe, maybe you're, we'll get there in a few slides. So, okay, so now we have this idea of, okay, these things that I thought were Java objects are actually references to Java objects. What's one of the more interesting consequences of this? When you call a function that takes an object or any type of object as an argument, it actually takes an object reference. What does that mean? It means that that function can modify that object. So what am I doing here? On line 11, I'm creating a new instance, uh, a new variable to store a reference to a person called me, and then I'm initializing it to refer to a new instance of person that I create with initial age of 38. And then I'm calling this function called birthday. Birthday takes a reference to a person. And because age is marked as public on my person class, it can increment the age. So on line 11, I create a single person object. That same, a reference to that person object gets passed to birthday. There's still only one person object in my system. So when birthday modifies the age, it's modifying the age of the same person object that I created on line 11. And so when I'm done and I print the age on line 13, I'm gonna see the updated age. So how does this work? So when I start, I have this reference called me. Once birthday starts to run, it copies the reference into the argument that it receives called to set. So when birthday is running, it's using a reference variable called to set that's also a reference to a person object. And so when it increments the age, that change is seen by everybody with a reference to the person object. Once the function completes, that variable is destroyed, but I still have a reference to my person object that I uh, had before I called the function. So this is essentially what happens when I call functions in Java and pass them a reference, an object as an argument. All right, so again, as promised, if I start me with 39, I'm going to see four. So some of you, you know, one of the parts of MP3 is designed to kind of force you to reckon with this a little bit. So some of you have been having errors because when you are asked to produce a copy of the board, you actually don't produce a copy. You produce a new array that has references to the same player objects as your first array. And so what happens is I can still modify those player objects, which is not what we wanted you to do. Which is a great segue to my next slide, because in Java, arrays store references to objects, not the objects themselves. So what am I doing here? So I have my normal person class that I've been using for these examples. On line seven, I create an array of person objects, but I'm actually not creating an array of person objects. I'm creating an array of references to person objects. So what Java does is it sets aside enough memory to store four references to person objects. How many actual person objects have been created at this point? Zero. So when I, and, and again, this is something you have started to sort of encounter on some of, you know, the MP or on some of our homework problems. This does not allocate any people. There are no persons that are created. If I want to create new person objects, I can do that. So here's how to initialize this array. So that loop that starts at line eight and ends at line 10 is going through my array of references to person objects, which are initially all null, and it's changing them from null to refer to a new person object. So how many times is new called by the time I get to line 11? Person dot length is four, so that loop is run four times, and I've called new four times. Remember, every time I call new, Java is setting aside memory somewhere on your computer to store a person object. 
So before I run the loop on line seven, I have set aside memory for four person references, but zero actual person objects. Once the loop finishes, I now still have that array that I declared on line seven, but now all of its references refer to actual person objects that were created using new. So let's do the, so now, okay, so now let's look at the next loop, so lines 11 to 14. I'm creating a second array, so now I have two arrays, each one holds four references to person objects. So after line 11, I have eight references to person objects, but only four actual person objects that were created in that first loop. And then what am I doing in the loop that starts at line 12 and ends at line 14? I'm copying something, but what am I copying? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm copying the references. I'm actually not copying the person objects. So when I'm done, when I get to line 15, how many person objects have been created? Four. Only the ones created in the loop from eight to 10. If you don't see new, there's no new object. So now what I do is I go through my first array and I increment all the ages. And then I go through my second array and I print all the ages. But remember, those two arrays store references to the same four person objects. So when the array on line 15 modifies the objects using the people array of references, it's modifying the same people person objects that I'm going to then read when I go through same people. All right, so let's do this. Okay, so my loop from line 10 to 12, the first person it creates has an age of 18, 19, 20, and 21. And then when I go through people, I'm adding 10 to all of their ages, and then I'm using same people to retrieve the age, and you'll see that I've modified the ages of all those people. There were four people in my system. They started out 18, 19, 20, and 21. Life happened. You know, you went to graduate school, like you got a crappy job, you know. Uh, you moved to a new town, 10 years go by, and now it's 28, 29, 30, and 31. But there's only four people in my system. I've only created four person options. Questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do I actually, so, so here's where I'm gonna go with that question. The question is, how do I actually copy the, the objects? So I know how to copy references, that's really easy. It's just typical assignment. But how do I actually copy the objects themselves? Which is a good segue to my next slide. So there is, in Java, there is actually no built-in way to copy Java objects. You may like that about the language. You may hate that about the language. Some languages don't have this feature. Some languages do have this feature. Java doesn't. So there's no built-in way to copy objects. Remember those three methods we talked about in Java that every object has. I can print it, I can check if it's equal to another object, and I can get a hash code from it. There's no copy. It just doesn't exist. I don't have to implement it. So what do I do if I want to copy an object? So object does provide a clone method but there's no requirement that objects actually implement this properly. So in a lot of cases, clone doesn't do what you think. You can also implement something called a copy constructor. So here's an example of a copy constructor, and this is actually something that we used on MP3. I have a constructor as part of my object that takes, as an argument, an existing object. So this basically says, how do I create a new object based on an existing object? The reason that I frequently want to override the default behavior here is a lot of times I want to do something a little bit different. Like, I want to copy some of the fields, I might need to reinitialize some other fields, and things like that. So making a copy of an object is actually quite subtle. You might think about copying your connectN instances. How would you do that? 
Like, do you want to copy all the state of the board? Do you want to use the same players and make copies of the players? There's some decisions to make. So, in a lot of cases, this is left up to the object class itself to define how to do. So in this case, I've only got one instance variable that's part of my class, and I just make a copy of it, right? But you can imagine classes that have more state might want to make copies of certain things, and then in other cases, reinitialize other things, right? So maybe making a copy of a connect end board means that I get the same dimensions as the first board, but I get a new game. So I start over, and I can, the, the, the game starts empty. So that's up to you to define. So here's where this gets interesting, right? So here I've got a person class. And in the previous example, I just had an age. And when I make copies of primitive types in Java, I actually have a copy. I have two different um, integers, two different doubles. But we've been talking about this. What am I actually copying here? So what is pet? Pet is not a pet object, it's a reference to a pet object. This is why in my constructor, if I wanted an actual pet object, I would have to say pet is equal to new pet and call one of its constructors. So if I copy it this way, what am I actually copying? I'm copying the reference. So if this was my copy constructor for person, what would happen is after I ran it, I'd have two people, two person objects, but I'd still only have one pet. So this is where this gets sort of complex, right? It's this idea that if I just make a copy of the reference, that's usually not what I want to do when I'm copying things. So sometimes your copy constructor depends on other object copy constructors, because now I have to figure out how do I make a copy of a pet? Because I don't want these two new person, I don't want this new person necessarily to, sh to share the same pet as the previous person. There are cases in which that works out, but uh, normally you may not want to do that. Okay. This, you guys are gonna get practice with today, right? So when I have two references to the same object, they refer to literally the same object. There's only one object, and I have two references to it. So this is why we've been encouraging you to use equals when you compare objects. If you compare object references using the double equal sign, what you're actually doing are comparing the two references. You're not comparing the objects themselves. If you want to compare the objects themselves, happily, we have a dot equals method that you can use. And you can override that to compare objects in a way that's appropriate to the specific kind of object that you're using. If the two objects, if my, if I have two references to the same object, then dot equals is almost always true unless I'm some sort of weirdo and I've overwritten it to return false. You can do that. You can have your dot equals method return false. Like, I am not like anybody else. Even if it's me, right? Even if you're asking, are you equal to yourself? You can say, no. It's not very useful. If two references are not the same, they may still refer to the same object, right? or they may refer to two objects that the class has defined to be equals, to be equal. So that's what dot equals is for. You as the class designer now have a chance to tell Java what it means for two instances of your class to be the same. Again, maybe some of the variables are the same, other ones you don't care about, right? Other ones are like private state that you don't want to compare when you, when you call it dot equals. So, Again, here's the case where I have two person objects of the same age. I've overridden the equals method to compare their ages. So what's line 12 going to print? False, I have two different references, right? So they're not equal to each other, but what's line 13 going to print? True, because I've defined two people to be equal if their age is the same. I know we're almost out of time, but let me let me do this, okay? So now I have two different references to the same object. So what's line 12 going to print? True, right? So I can run this, I can see true, and like I said, there's no requirement that your equals function do anything useful. 
don't do this, okay? This is like the worst line of code I've showed you the entire semester. I know it looks innocuous. Um, but your dot equals method can return anything it wants. It could just return false. Okay. We are out of time. I'm gonna come back and we'll, we'll finish up this conversation on Monday. Um, I have a couple of announcements. I just wanted to make sure I posted a picture of my cat because that seems to be a meme going around right now. So in computer science, your cat does your taxes for you. Uh, she's just signed the tax form that we sent to the IRS the other day. Um, so MP3 is due Monday. Please finish it up this weekend. Get there, this is important MP, it's not droppable. I do not have office hours today. I took them off the calendar. I will see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.